All right, guys, we are here. Welcome to the Warnering Sword Project, and we are doing Shop Talk. It's me, Spencer, and I have my wonderful co-host. Adam, hi. <laughs> so we've been trying to work on some other content as we've been doing things for the Wandering Sword. We've been working on lots of different projects. And really, we just wanted to start off by trying to do something that's fun to do, people would like it, and we came up with Shop Talk. It was actually Adam's idea. Well, what made you think about that, Adam? Um, well, we were working on the same projects with a couple other groups, and we were sitting there, and we realized some of the most interesting content that we were putting out, or that we were getting put out, was us just kind of riffing about ideas and talking about swords and talking about fighting and what, 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 when, where, and why. And we were like, man, we should just talk shop on on camera. Yeah, I'm near like, fun. shop talk. What about shop, shop, talk? shop talk? I was like, swords sounds great. So anyway, we're going to kick it off first. I decided that because I'm this way I am, we're going to start off with a bad sword pun. So, oh, Adam, Adam, yeah. how was Rome cut in two? I'm terrified to hear the answer. I, I don't know. With a pair of Caesars. Really? That's the joke? Yeah, you made that's the, cut? the starting one. That's how we're starting. It's, it's only going to go up from here. So anyway, with that bad little lame... <laughs> We're going to go show you guys, if you haven't checked out our director's cut yet, we're going to show it to you right now. So wait. And, and so you guys know director's cut. This is something that Spencer has been putting together of us using different pieces of equipment to go through different pieces of, you know, stuff. So uh, I'm excited to see us do a whole pile more of these because they were a blast to do. So by all means, if you would, sir. All righty. With Without any further ado, one sec, sorry about that. <laughs> Can everyone hear it and see it? All right, let's go. And bear with us, guys. We're, we're, we're new to all this. I'm not getting any audio. You're not getting any audio on this one? Let me see. Let's see if it, no, no. So that's the fun thing with everything that gets, keeps going. You're learning. You're, yeah. We're going to polish this up. It's going to be almost professional someday. One of these days. Right. All right. Right. First try. There we go. Oh. <laughs> oh, goofy. Uh, I am still cleaning watermelon out of the yard from this endeavor. Uh, just, just to be clear, it was a hell of a day. Uh, sorry, not sorry. Hey, Juniper. Hey, Will. <laughs> hey, everyone. Thank you guys for joining in today. Juniper. Oh, my God. I haven't seen you in forever. I hope <laughs> you're doing really, really well. So you guys saw this one. It's a little bit harder when you're streaming it wise. If you haven't, if it wasn't super clear for you, still would love for you guys to actually check this out on the YouTube channel uh, when you guys get finished, since that's where we are. Uh, my little brother Avery has been helping us with editing. We had this idea. We were gonna start doing this every other week and using different kind of weapons as well as cutting other different types of fruit or things. Now, of course, a lot of watermelon was harmed in the making of this video, but we ate as much as we could. Uh, so did my dog. Yeah, he loved it. Uh, let me pull it real back real quick. It was really funny to watch Kyle and you. So we get this part where we're first starting, and we have you doing this nice little side cut. Side cut. What did you think about how it was going to work when you first started doing that swing? Um, it's interesting because, uh, like, for a lot of us, when we're not using an edged weapon all the time, right? So a bunch of us are SCA fighters and uh, and then, you know, myself and some other folks that might be on here later, hopefully. Hey, Sam. Um, hey, Sam. Sam. Oh, great. Oh, man. I am Thanks. so happy you're here, dude. You've always got good stuff going on. I appreciate you stopping in. Um, but we're all used to throwing uh, something round with a theoretical edge when you're mm -hmm. actually swinging a sword. 
you have to really focus on the edge. And a lot of it is just that pull through. Mm -hmm. But really what I was thinking of is please don't cut a chunk out of my table. (laughs) (laughs) You you didn't. It was a little shallow, but it was good. Nice, strong. Of course, we that when you get that deep slice cut on that last one. So good. I felt really good about that one. I was like, oh, and it just like slides out from underneath itself. Uh, I was really happy. And please, anyone, if you guys have any questions, it's really organic. Like I said, we're talking, we're talking, talking chop. We're chop talking. So if there's something that you see and you're like, whoa, what'd you guys do there? Or just let us know. And I'm trying to just answer with you. And Kyle goes and does this little nice side chop. He goes, it's actually pretty darn sweet for how that, deep and that how. That back edge was nice. It was really good. I think it's that nice. You just see that big smile. Once again, I'm sorry about the filter rate because it's showing through this. But it was really fun. Uh, then I got so that actually, but now I'm going to talk myself up on that one. That was really fun. Like the, you see the crack from before, if you guys, we were doing stabs and we pushed it off and it cracked because we're like, oh no, but just put it back up there and cut it. And in the video, you can hear Adam saying like, swing through, swing through. Will's there. I said, resistance. How's the cut through? How the really power? Oh, so on this one, I felt it really just goes through as long as you keep true edge, right, Adam? That's what yeah. Um, for so if your if your plane comes in even, right, nice and even, nice and flat, or in in a nice straight line, as long as you don't deviate while the cut is happening, it just goes clean through. It was actually one of those things I I for a lot of people that I've at least you know done cutting demos and stuff with, they're like that was surprisingly easier than I thought. Yeah. When the edge stays true, it just right through nothing almost no resistance it's almost terrifying how little effort you need now this little part we were just messing around we had more <laughs> edge. I was like see how many more times you can cut it without cutting your table and obviously every single time he's cutting this i'm giving him more anxiety because he's like i really don't i don't want to cut my table i'm like again uh, again and again <laughs> And then I got stupid. Yep. That <laughs> back edge flick was dumb. That was actually, let's see that real quick again. That back edge flick was actually really, really cool. And for people that don't, don't do a lot of sword play, trying to spin it off and having that true edge, there's so much travel. I know it's all goofy in the video right there, but he's looking where he wants to go and he's trying to end his wrist at the end. Or actually, Adam, what was going through your mind when you're doing that? Um, I was trying to rotate and and flick and just have the tip make the contact um, because that's where the most speed and the most power is going to be at the end of the shot. Mm-hmm. But uh, but being like, precise oh, though, being yeah, precise. I was trying to like, I, what, you, what he totally edited it out so I don't look like a complete noob is the like four times I missed before that and was like inches outside of the target. I'm like, oh, I don't know uh, what you're talking about. You did it on the uh, first try. I don't know uh, if I paid uh, every day. <laughs> There goes my golf caddy of swords again. But, uh, oh, and Sam. So Sam says, I uh, really need to do show this. I need to do more actual cutting. Unfortunately, I'm not good at sharpening. Um, been thinking about getting some tatami mats for cutting. That's yes. a really cool idea. Tatami is, I think it's expensive because, one, you're using it and then it's done. Yeah. I mean, if you do it nice little ribbons, you have nice little things you can hang up there. But it's hard because it's just gone. Uh, other thoughts that if you want to think about, for cutting, I would use clay, honestly. If you make little clay towers, which is what we're trying to, we're gonna start using, I've left the clay at home, so we had to massacre watermelons and then eat as much as we could. Uh, yeah, it was terrible. <laughs> it was wonderful. Every time I see this video now, now I want more watermelon. Um, not to be stereotypical super cool at all. But I I think if you do cut with the tommy mats too, soak them in water like as much as you can and put like a weight on them and soak them overnight or at least eight hours. That will make it more the consistency of, not to be squeamish or anything, of flesh, because the wet tatami mat cuts way different than a dry. You'll see some people where they cut with only dry. One dry can scratch your swords. It shouldn't mess up your swords, but the wear and tear. The cut mm-hmm. makes it go through smoother. So that's my only tips for that. Uh, where, let's see, that was, which sword were we using for that? Oh, so this sword, we were using Sir Bronze sword, and this from yep. Logan. Good to see you, Squire, bro. Uh, it was one of his swords, which is more of, it's a type it's more like a type 11. I'm trying to see. Oh, that's a weird curve in this part. Trying to show the picture. Mm, really good edge oh. on this one. Yeah, yeah, it is closer to an 11. Than oh, 11. there we go. Yeah, so you can see it in the back part with Kyle's right there. It's more of a type 11 or type 12. Uh, we, I think he, I don't know if he got that one from Coles with Athena. I'm not exactly sure, but a lot of those ones are about the same. Do you remember? Uh, no, 
I will ping him. We can put it in the show notes. That'd be awesome. We will do that. Um, make a note right now. And it's cool when you look at, you can see the fuller in the back as the back behind Kyle's head. Uh, people would call these also sometimes blood grooves and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But really, they don't really do a whole lot for the blood groove wise. Some people say there's a sucking wound. It makes more difference. But honestly, when they had those like pyramid shaped balls, that were like more like a piece of rebar and it was shaped into a triangle that more made different wounds opposed to a sword with different fullers. The fullers, what they did was when you grind them out, it makes them lighter, but yet it mm -hmm. still keeps the rigidity. What are you going to say? Adam, I'm sorry. No, I, I was agreeing. Uh, and structurally the steel gets uh, like when you have that pyramid shape, uh, that like long pyramid, almost ax, ax like edge, you get a lot more, you get more mass behind the blow, but it, it doesn't keep um, the the. I've noticed at least that the follow through mm -hmm. is more difficult. It's not mm -hmm. as clean, and with the the shape being um, almost a bow tie looking shape, you know, if the bow tie was sharp, like if you lay a bow tie down, right, mm -hmm. and it kind of gets that little spot in the center, and you go out and in, like these are, um, yeah, yeah, they're significantly lighter, and uh, and then because the steel has shape to it, it's it's more structural and yeah. it can flex more. Yeah. Cause otherwise you have to put more rigidity on top, like to make it stronger. Mm -hmm. uh, there's other things they do in history. So let's go ahead let's take that down real quick. Also the length of the blood group is very important to note. Yeah. Yeah. Now the fullers really make a big difference as far as fuller. with a, that, that's right. I was trying to use the right terminology. That was cute. That's fine. That's fine. Uh, there's another video where we're just being goofy for Memorial day. And uh, I was cutting some, we had a lot of watermelons died over the past couple of days. And I'm not saying I'm only against watermelons, but they're really useful for cutting. And as far as the consistency goes, it's really, really nice. So this one, I look little wrist cuts. And, and that's, then, a, and that's a training sword. That's not a sharp. Correct. Ah, uh, you caught hilarious. it. Hilarious. Yeah. And it's interesting when people, they'll say a lot of times, well, a sword has to be super sharp for it to go through something that is definitely not the case because as you can see me when i do these little wrist cuts i'm using very little force mm -hmm. now that being said that's all you need to actually cut like flesh honestly people think about these big giant baseball swings all these you don't need it's just a little bit of a little bit of a cut to it yep especially with a good sharp sword and yeah. like so i mean obviously we're counter dictionary so it's just a little bit here but how sharp the sword is doesn't particularly matter if you're if you're swinging at an unarmored opponent. Exactly, that's what I was going to say. More so, it's more with the unarmored point, and mm -hmm. that's when you get to the whole armored and unarmored. It's interesting. Uh, show another little part. This is where me and my friend uh, Bo Ring were fighting. We we're just doing some steel combat. We we're just tagging each other. It's more of a point combination. So we're just doing points like you're hitting, even like though. Boxing. Yeah, pretty much. Now, if I did that to an armor point on the head cut, that would be, it doesn't take a lot. It wouldn't split their skull quite open, but it would definitely give them a cut. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'll be up. That's exactly, well, you beat me to it. Exactly. Um, sorry, and people, it's not sharp, but some, a misconception that people forget, though, is my, that's why a lot of steel fighting organizations mm -hmm. or anything, they stress safety because it doesn't take a lot to cut skin, like especially with the tip of the sword, even if it's not a non-sharp sword. Um, when I was fighting Jamsborg or any kind of a steel fighting one, they fight without helmets on on some of the parts, but yet you're still using steel. But they are very, very, very emphasized on training. They start you off on wind swords. They start you off on all these other things before they let you fight other people with swords. And then they do steel tests to make sure you're safe. They kind of put you through a pressure test. They basically kind of jump you, make you tired, and see if you're going to mess up. And you don't want to get tired and hit somebody. Yep. Worst thing you can do is hurt your friends. Yeah. Especially. It's the only other person you've got to swing swords at. So. No one wants that. And then actually, talk about, you're talking about guards. Let's talk about just paths. So this is a interesting. People may see it in uh, Fiore. You see it in all these different things where they talk about the planes that you can cut on. Mm -hmm. uh, there's only really eight 
right? I mean, you can still do it in between all these, but these are your basic angles. So you got your high, like if you're in a high guard going straight yep. down, wow. that's right there. You can do a low straight up, that's two. You can do your right side across diagonal. You can do your from left to right straight up. Then you got your left diagonal cross, left straight up. Then you got horizontal, horizontal back, eight paths. Um, a lot of times with people training with swords, we just talk about like teaching them these angles of attack. And it's just interesting. And what do you think? Do you have anything on that part? No, I, it's, it's a really good point to make. And uh, the well, I think what's very important to notice about this, even this design, is that your sword, your goal should always be to end, end through the center um, of your target, th through it and out the other side. And the point of that is, in, it's it's energy transfer, right? I don't. I don't throw with the intent to just stop on where I'm throwing. I throw with the intent to hit what I'm going through and go all the way through it out the other side. And that's how you impart as much energy as possible on a sword shot. Yeah. Yeah. And it's something where when people are fighting, when I'm actually fighting Adam, these are all options depending on what he has open. However, right. once you start getting up into different levels of fighting, it's also what I can make him open up. Uh, you're not throwing at shots at what you want to be open. You throw shots that are available or you move them in positions to make these other shots open up. Um, yeah. And Will has a good point. It's follow through like baseball. Yes. Yes. You, hit, you don't, you don't hit the ball and stop. That's a bunt and it doesn't go anywhere. Right. You, that's the point of it. You're like, Oh, and it just skips along the ground. But when you follow all the way through that ball and then the ball takes off like a rocket, that's, because you're imparting that force. And very good reference, Will. Thanks, man. That's a very good reference. I'm trying to find uh, there's one from stances, shot openings, uh, sequences. Oh, this is a good part. People, so someone throwing a sword wise or throwing a shot, you, this is from a high guard or not necessarily high, but it's a higher swing going downwards. The sword goes down and this from the passing and striking. And then it doesn't show the teardrop back, but where that sword goes in this part, yep. it's going in a teardrop and then coming right back up. And then you go from other position, doing stuff with your swords, you're recovering the shield, leading stance. Now, a lot of these books, we'll put this link. Uh, there's a PDF, free PDF, a lot of information that you're learning. It doesn't cost a lot. You just you share it with other people where it would cost you to buy this book, but why not just give them information freely? Um, yeah. Right. And yeah, a lot of this, and Sam's got a good point. A lot of the mm -hmm. stuff that you you see when it comes to like referencing how to fight with a sword and things like that are, it's just like a lot of different martial arts. There's only mm -hmm. so many ways to swing a thing at a thing. Yeah. Um, and you, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, and he's uh, referencing the, the the Meyer square, uh, which is a longsword technique, or well, it's a Lichtenauer. Well, yeah, Lichtenauer. Mm -hmm. And even though they only started to come around more in the 16th century. Just like, uh, I don't remember when Fiore started. I'm a horrible person that part. My uh, European side knowledge is definitely lacking, being more of a, a Eastern uh, Japanese slash background for myself. But even though it wasn't written there, that's the interesting part, Sam, where we start getting into what I call, uh, not extreme, but you're actually experimental archaeology or experimental historians, where people still probably did it, but maybe it wasn't written down yet. Uh, which I'm sure you know 100%, but it's really interesting to see that. Um, what's another part? There's something where we were talking about openings. Ah, yeah. Uh, this is a good point, and it's a good little little trainer lesson. So in this book, they talk about the major shield and sword guard, and then, even though we're talking about chop talk, we are talking about single sword, but still people use swords with shields most of the time. Um, you look at these. Now, this book, it talks about the vulnerable targets being indicated in the darker areas. That being said, you don't really see the darker areas in this. Oops, sorry. In this translation, I was trying to actually show up. My bad. Sorry. I'll just use my little mouse thing. Um, Adam, on this one, top left, where are the openings that you see on a person that you find? Uh, I would say uh, leading leg and side ahead. Mm, mm -hmm. And left side ahead. Because you're going to get a little bit of impedance with the sword if you're going to throw across the body there. Yeah. Oh, and Sam, 14th century. That sounds about right. I didn't want to mention something. Let's see what. Bill K also saying. So do you guys only sword fight or do you also do cut and thrust? Oh no. With everyone in the wandering sword, pretty much anything that has to do with fighting, we we do. Are it. Happy to do it. <laughs> and that's it's a good point that you have with that. Is we when. Kyle and I first started this and then we get everybody together. We wanted 
it's kind of like doing the Jeet Kune Do of swords, or there's it's just it's the path of sword play. Now, granted, there will be fist fighting and other things that works too, but we are predominantly talking about sword play. Uh, yeah, anything that has to do with swinging a sword, we like playing. If it's Belagarth, foam systems, uh, Eskrima, uh, anything. I mean, us personally, I mean, done a lot of Viking reenactment. Uh, Adam here is also a Belgarth knight, and you've been playing for what twenty years? Yeah, coming up on twenty years. Yeah, yeah. and then we're both a uh, society of SCA or SCA knights as well. Um, myself, eleven years, and Adam's just been playing. How long have you been playing SCA, Adam? Uh, eight years coming up. Eight, on. eight years. So we anything really we love playing traditional fencing, historical fencing. Uh, we do Hema as well as um, some Hama, all kinds of things. Good question, Bill. And then. Kyle, or sorry, William also has another question. He said he heard a theory about plates and the, the fic books that he thought was interesting. Surviving examples were more like advertisements only showing parts of moves having actual thought. That's a good point, too. Um, yeah, that makes sense because when you, like, if you were to look at this, uh, just like this picture we're showing right here, um, the reasons for winding up in these different positions or, or being in these different guards have a lot to do with your opponent. Like if Spencer and I were fighting and he's very obviously pointing and putting a lot of pressure down on my leg, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't stand in this first position. I would probably stand something closer to this last position or second to last down there at the bottom, mm -hmm. right? That one right there. And then something different with my sword. Cause that's just a terrible way to stand in my opinion. <laughs> but <laughs> you just your threats are you've got one threat instead of a number of threats. Yeah. Um and that actually is a good trip. That back position with the back uh back sword position is almost when he was doing the watermelon cut, something where you come around and you're doing a flick. It's not used as often because your timing, your range, and everything can be stuffed, but it's still mm -hmm. a valid move. It's just yeah, it's just tough. It's but everything has a time and a place. Yeah. And just might not be right now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But does that make sense, Will? I think so. And I think also advertisements is interesting medieval-wise. If it didn't work, people died. So if a lot of people were dying, they weren't using it. Or they'd be like, let me try something differently. Or hopefully you had a chance to try. Granted, yeah. there was practice. Not every single sword event ended in somebody dying. A lot of times it's just like posturing. And that's why you talk about in some cultures where it was to the first blood. Um, even though that was more talked about later in period. It yeah, still it's happened. more of a uh, tournament culture understanding of sword fighting, which if you want to go to traditional sword fighting and people who, who used it every single day for real, real life, I mean, that you really have to stick to the Japanese. They were early on pretty, pretty, pretty amazing at their dedication to that craft. And then with the tournament culture happening, Later in, uh, like, uh, later in period, in the English and the German, you know, lines of time. Mm -hmm. I, it's such an interesting time because we don't know all what was happening exactly the same time in the planet. And that's why yeah. when people talk about this is better than this better. As you said before, the sword can only swing so many ways. You can only swing the sword so many ways. As long as you have two arms, two legs, it's pretty much close, similar. Um, well, it's got a good question about could you... Uh, yeah, thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, could be seen as like freeze frames in a fight. Like this is where you end up. That's that makes good sense, and that is correct. But in 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 my experience, if you have stopped, you've probably lost. It's. I mean, here we get into conjecture, right? It's right. interesting where as long as you don't get behind someone else's timing. Uh, from a modern term, we call it something called an Oda loop, and it was the first came up in I believe it was World War One or World War Two. I forget the name of the fighter pilot, but you got in a loop. You do something, the other plane do something, and you try to make the other plane, you get ahead of that loop. And if you keep on making that plane react to you, you're going to win that dogfight. Same thing with swords. Yep. If you Getting keep on the putting them positions and they get in defensive all the time, if you were doing a cut and you moved and you stopped and then you maybe did a thrust, that's fine as long as you're in control of the fight. Right. Control uh, is very important. Yeah. No, I think it's very interesting. Now, here another short shield one. This shield's uh, more of a kite, so that changes your openings, right? Because we got here on the left side, on the first leftmost picture, your openings are really on the left leg, maybe a little bit, but if you're reaching out that far to the right leg, you're still going to have to worry about the sword. Mm -hmm. So you're not having a whole lot of shields make differences, but then you can also 
make people's shield work against them. Right. And in the period in which uh, the sword that we were talking about, that we plan on talking about today, mm -hmm. is from, this type of shield was really common. Yes, yes. And speaking on that just a little bit, we talk about grips as well. There's all these kind of different tapered grips for the sword. Our one that we were using was more of a tapered, a basic tapered. Yep. But we have some belted, you've seen the bottle's kind of interesting. And really this comes down to more of a preference thing. If you have preferences with this, what feels better in your hand, what type of techniques you like using, what size your hand is, how big your hand, or how like actually big your fingers are. All yeah, with with your palm, all that, all that has a lot to do with where you want to grip your sword or how you want to grip your sword. Or yeah, um, sorry, I have one more on this part. Let me get into hilts, where it's interesting. They have hilts, different types. You get the the swept hilts. You get some more of the curves, which are trapping. Once again, all depends on styles of how you feel. Sorry about that. All about styles of what you feel comfortable with or what you like doing with your swords. Obviously, we got this one right here that has like kind of a, a bracket, not a parentheses like these ones, but more of a bracket. You can trap swords. However, your sword can also be trapped with a shield as well. So it's kind of, you got to be careful with your reasoning on that. Mm -hmm. uh, ba -ba 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 -ba. There's just a few more different hilts. Looking at it from the other angle, not all hilts are square. No, it's a square, and it's important to note that a lot of a lot of sword techniques in the time, especially uh, once you got into two-handed sword, used uh, used half grip, or used gripping gripping up the blade with your gauntleted hand, and then using the back, like using the back of the sword as almost a improvised like war pick. Yeah. Oh, um, yeah. But but most of the time, the single-handed swords wasn't as yeah. used as much. You're right. Oh, well, you're fine. But nothing oh. like nothing like a good uh, cross hilt punch. No, that's true. And actually, <laughs> okay, I was going to show you the arc thing, but then Adam came up with a really good point, which let me see if I still have it. Pommels. People don't talk about pommels enough in a lot of, I mean, there are historic texts, especially if you think about some of the Germans, Fiores as well. They talk about, they have some moves where there'll be people in a bind, and then they have the sword like right about here, or this part there, and you're like, what are they doing? Pommel strike. Yep. It's you got the Viking type lobe ones, which still, I mean, all of them hurt, all different ones. They're all different looks, uh, feels, weight. Of course, they're meant for balancing the sword, mostly and foremost. However, striking points is not not at all overlooked. Uh, it's kind of interesting. You look at some of the fishtails, keys, bobbed. The one we were using was more of <laughs> a tea cozy or kind of almost a Brazil nut type style. Uh, in other fight systems, uh, SCA allows pommel strikes, but yet on weapons, like once again, more of the two handers, we don't really have them on single hands, which I think is more interesting when you get into the HEMA historical European martial arts, because you actually practice the strikes and doing these. Um, in SCA, what they say, like, after you get pommel strike, that may not have killed you, but you're stunned for, I don't know, we're all wearing open face masks in that game by what the rules would be set, even though we're really wearing close face. Like getting hate, punched in the mouth with a, your fist, let alone a metal uh, pommel, that guy's gonna stab you afterwards, guy or gal. That's, yeah, toast, toast, oh, yeah. toast. It's a bad way to go. It's a cracked collarbone for sure if you're doing it right. Yeah. It's real hard to fight with a broken collarbone. Right, yeah. Will? <laughs> Aw, that's Aww. true. So in this angle, this shows about the arcs of the blades. So what we were looking at with the pictures once before, main thing, and going back yet again, let's uh, double it up real quick. When I was fighting uh, Bo with this in the film part, he's throwing a shot. We, let's stop it. Right when I go, I'm going to do a right one after this part. I'm going to throw, he has an opening. I throw the right one right there. So once again, just that freeze frame right there. Let's, sorry, I'm trying to. That arc, people don't think about them when you look at pictures. Yeah, look at the travel. Like, what, Adam, what are you thinking about that traveling when you're in this coin with that? Uh, when I'm throwing a shot like that, I'm trying to have it be deceiving. I uh, want the, the sword to come as straight in as possible. Mm -hmm. So the less outside movement, your eye, your eye will follow left to right almost more than it will follow forward and back. Mm. So you see this happen. With the tip flipping, flicking to the side or in or making a loop, easy. But just from here to straight to the camera, it's hard to read 
that that movement started until you're almost halfway there, which is why I really like that that straight line snap to the head you threw. Oh, and, and no problem. And it's really hard, I think, even though we're talking about chop talk, and this is the part where this whole kind of amalgamation gets put together. In boxing, when people throw shots, they're not really always going like this big real hook. It's a jab. You're doing a jab. You can still throw a jab with a sword, and you lead it. And then by the time it starts getting registered, you're like, oh. Now, however, when you have arcs, which still happen, that's where the arcs come in. And like uh, Adam was talking about, it was just a little snap. So you're going to see it. The arc would be a lot smaller like this uh, – more third one right about here. So the person's not going to have as much time to re react. But yeah, I think that's really, it's something that people don't think about. I don't know. Do you talk about that a lot with your fighters, Adam? I mean, yeah. Probably do. Yeah, we talk We talk about taking the tells and the, the visual representation of the sword movement out as much as possible, even to the point of trying to set your shoulder low and being able to push with your hip to turn your shoulder mm -hmm. so you don't have that that shoulder hitch coming forward as a tell in your shot. Yeah. So. No, I think it's pretty good. That's a good, good point. For some of those other people who are just tuning in today, thank you guys for joining. We are here. We're doing Chop Talk. We're talking about all different kinds of swords and as well as fighting and interesting and showing a little bit of some of our videos as we go along. Um, for those of you just coming in, we're going to go ahead and show you what we did before. Let's show our little trailer because I just love it. Not trailer, but our little intro. Yeah. That I like. And, uh, and and Soto has a good question as well. And yes, hips, man. Hips all day. Hips oh, where always. power lives. Always all hips. All right. Can you hear Adam? Or wait, I made it quiet. There you go. A little too loud. There we go. <laughs> That's such a silly shot. <laughs> it it is crazy how fast that it just goes through it. It's just it's just so clean. Just and we and, and the fact that we did a couple of cutting demos with uh um with rebated uh and and the the final like the the cuts were almost as clean. You're like ooh, ugh. yeah yeah no definitely true. But yeah, Logan was very right about the hips wise. So with these images, uh, we're getting from a couple of several books that I have. We're gonna put them in the links down below. We're also gonna give the JPEG away, or not the JPEG, sorry, uh, the PDF as well. So you guys can look through this. This one's all about sword and shield. It's has all different single, different kind of ways. We'll we'll share it because we're all about sharing the knowledge here. And yeah, let me see what else we got real quick. Does anyone else have any questions while we're going on? I'm going to show, let's go into guards we talked about. We'll start off with the guard that you hate so much. Uh, you know who does this? Who? Uh, Duke Steven. <laughs> Duke Steven pulls this guard, and it. And I have seen him throw everything from, uh, like, a palm down, uh, like, palm down to palm up, like, hooking stab to the mm -hmm. body or to the head from this guard. And mm -hmm. also he'll come forward blind with blinding his opponent with his shield. So you can't see his sword coming in or at least blinding your vision of his sword. And he'll move a little bit and pick a side and then he'll turn it up and turn it into a flat snap, mm -hmm. and turn it into a flick on side and offside. It's, it's real fun to watch. He's hilarious to fight. I, I miss that gentleman very much. Uh, yeah. He throws, he throws some stuff that feels crazy, but for whatever reason, it lands just fine, and you get I Hey, practice makes perfect in all things. And the individual we're talking about right now, his name is Duke Steven of the SCA. Awesome. Duke Steven of Beckenham. He was knighted in 1981, but he's still... And it's not like he's still a badass for his age. No, this guy fights nah, he's still on good. a really great level. He's in he's great shape, really good. and he's amazing. And he fights in the scarred, 
And as long as you work on your timing and you're controlling the other person's timing, you can do a lot of things that people don't uh, expect. It's kind of like the flicker jab in boxing where people are here, they're throwing flicks out this way where it's not as strong. You don't see it like really modern in the States, but it's more of an old school style. But it will work if you have your differences in. Yep. So that's the back guard. Let's see about more of a middle guard. Actually, let's go to trying to see about the different stances. There, just go with this. So we have the basic high guard, which if you showed from the angle, it looks on the top there. Excuse me, back guard, and then we got the middle guard. Uh, high guards were more of a transition, but you can keep a guard up high as long as you're control controlling your range. Uh, middle guards, especially if you're in the scrum of battle, like when you think about Vikings going through a scrum or pushing through, you're keeping that shield them close to you. You can still have enough power to do cuts. You can cut little angles, cut through people's hands. That's something used as well. Yeah, and Will's got a good point. These, mm -hmm. these aren't defensively... Uh, a couple of these really leave you lacking because you don't have an offensive threat. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's important to note that these are transitional positions. Like mm -hmm. as, you, as you hit this position, it might be because you threw that shot, that that left to right hip, right? And you mm -hmm. sort of wound up back here as you're coming forward again. This isn't where you're just standing back here usually. Mm -hmm. And as we see this wheel of transitions right here, you can see yourself. Now, they don't have to go from point A to point B. You could go from this one to a back, or you could go this to straight there or to more of a middle guard and then swing. It's mm -hmm. all swinging, it's all moving and seeing where your positioning is going. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. a really good thought. Really good thought. Um, the thing we got, we got the little fullers that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. They had different types. There's some, and the sword doesn't have to have a fuller. Like, is that whole, uh, the myth apart is if you didn't have a fuller, it would just get stuck in an opponent's body is untrue. Uh, there's something called also a twist. <laughs> you can twist the sword to easily get it out. You can, uh, pull at angles. Um, there's many other different reasons. And you see some fullers go all the way to the tip of the sword. Some of them go halfway through. Some of them is just a single, like more of that uh, pyramid that Adam was talking about at the middle. Um, and some of them also combined together. Yep. Take some of the, and, and it's all about where you want the balance of your blade to be uh, for how deep or how far down the blade you grind this filler or the fuller. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Or 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 you pound a fuller in, depending on how depending on the process you're using. Um, Very true. Because if you want that good tip heavy sword, because you are fighting from a horse and you've got you know all that range to throw from, that's you know a little less a little less in the uh, down by your hand and more towards the tip means that your momentum takes the sword and the sword does a lot more work for you. Mm hmm. No, that's true. And then we think about if you're uh, any kind of martial arts, say practitioner, uh, HEMA, HAMA, SCA. Uh, Do Buzz Bell use a lot of pels? Do you guys talk about pel work or not really? Yes. Okay. No, well, it, yes, and over time it's gotten more. Okay. Uh, some of the higher end guys and people who've been really around for a long time do quite a man up pelling more than they'd initially thought and it's yeah. a lot of fun oh and sam had a good point too. he said he made a personal longsword with a triple floor oh those look so cool too and they're so yeah. wide yeah yeah how thick uh, if if you don't mind me asking sam uh what was your overall width at the handle like at, at your cross hilt what was the what was the finish width because i mean a triple fuller that thing has to be probably a pretty meaty pr pretty meaty sword i didn't think so so it's a long sword two handed. You know, you can get away with a little more, a little more mass in a sword like that. We're waiting to see what he says. Well, that's curious. Uh, so practicing the pell, I think pell practice. I didn't practice a lot with the pell at the very beginning of my uh, martial arts slash sword career. As I started doing more things, I think it was very interesting. It was something that I enjoyed doing, uh, especially instead of just throwing at air. It's different to actually have a target. Now, I you can throw hard at your pell if you want to, but it's not. It's more of ideas just practicing something and thinking about where it stops. Uh, you can throw it enough to where it bounces off, but you don't need to beat the heck out of your pell. You hear a lot of people chewing up their pells all the time. Not saying you don't have, you can't. Uh, some people put rubber, rubber on the side of their pells, or historically, people would tie rope. Um, all different kinds of things to do. Your rope wrapped pole. <laughs> <laughs> yup, yup. 
it, it doesn't take much to make a Pell, guys. And if that's something you're interested in doing, there are plenty of really good resources on how to make a Pell, how to make a very basic Pell like this one you're seeing here. It's literally just a post in the ground. Mm -hmm. Ah, so, so Sam. two inches at the hilt and 40 inches long. Oh, it's type 15. Style. Type 15. Interesting. I like it. I like it a lot. Um, and you can get your Pell as detailed as giving it a a, 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 a kind of a V-shaped body, having it have shoulders. You can put arms coming off or a, the, the upper arm at least. Um, you can give it a leg. Uh, the idea of a Pell does, is, also doesn't have to just be for sword fighting. Mm -mm. Uh, a lot of uh, a lot of different martial arts use that uh, Tai Chi or uh, Wing Chun style, um, like post pel. And that's pretty awesome. I'm gonna turn this one around real quick. One sec, let me fix it. Technique versus strength. Technique. Every time, you can be you can be as strong as you want. If your technique is crappy crap. Yeah, and it can work with you for a little while. But yet you're gonna get tired eventually. That's what a lot of people start seeing with uh oh uh, excuse me, some of the Battle of the Nations or Bow Hurt fight style fighting. You can mace you can pound it all out and do these things, but if you use your body, you use your technique, you're able to go longer and you're able to go and out wear out your opponent. Uh that's, that's where you continue to think. Yes, which is I think almost more important. And that's where a lot of the historical manuals actually start to come in there because you get a lot of people who are like, well, I've never done a historical manual at all, which is fine. And they're just either from an MMA boxing standpoint, but you're going to lose out because as you get tired, you're going to start missing more. But having good technique using your hips and following through is so much better. Oh, yeah. Uh, I had a picture I was showing. This is uh, this actually William Marshall and Philip Flanders, uh, two of the people with, you know, straight swords, single swords, single handed. Uh, this is also from horseback, which is an interesting dynamic, which uh, doing a little bit of horse mounted or mounted equestrian combat, it makes it all so interesting. So interesting talking point on William Marshall and his uh, his one of his go to moves in mm -hmm. the tournament was to ride up and snatch the reins of his opponent's horse and just lead them <laughs> man, horse and all back to their capture point, whatever that happened to be. Uh, to take their ransom. That's super cool. I like it. It's that thinking outside the box. Yeah, you would just ride by and snatch your reins and then just you ride imagine. off with you in tow. That's a, that's a heck of a move. But, uh, okay. man. Guess one there. The German Knights, more single sword as well. Look at this one's helms as well. Pretty cool. Uh, that's almost more like a great sword or long sword, even though it's still single handed. It doesn't have three fullers, but it's there. The knight in arms. Everyone used single swords. Everyone did. Yeah, got, pretty big, pretty big time. Got this guy. Oh, who's that? Oh, he has a single sword too. It's a cool Damascus one. What jerk? Look at that jerk. Yeah. I don't know. I got Kyle's too. He's got more of a messer, German style. We got a guy with a katana. Those are kind of cool too. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Saladin. No matter what other part in the world, man looks. They had single swords. Uh, the Mamluk era is really interesting too. You got Viking warrior and Saxons. It, Everyone used. Hmm? It's interesting how different cultural, like different cultural norms for swords, um, kind of adapted over time. Mm -hmm. Like you had the the, the Mamluks up there, mm -hmm. but um, more common for like your traditional or your in period. Uh, uh, Middle Eastern, like swordsman, mm -hmm. was uh, a scimitar or a shamshir. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And people, like I said, that's where they're like, well, they only had that. I'm like, no, people no. had stuff all the time too. Everything. Which actually, so we're at, oh, it's almost 30, 44 minutes. We're getting yeah. sort of close to the oh, end. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm going to go ahead and use, let me close this out for one sec. I hope you guys have been having fun. Thank you, those who have been hanging out and staying with us. We really appreciate it. Um, forgive me as I make. Adam Smaller, just for a sec. So we got the sword from a good friend in Austin, Texas. It's, his name is Damon Stiff. Uh, he does a lot of historical European or historical African martial arts. Uh, he's the president of HAMA. And let me turn off this music real quick. Or not the music, but the mute sound. 
I guess I guess we are now in a unboxing period of the show. I was not aware we were doing, but uh, here you go. Oh, good! It's in a second package. <laughs> uh, all right. So something to note that. One of the things that was so interesting about a scimitar in the time of like the Crusade era is that it was used against other traditional sham shears. Scimitars, no. Thank you for the correction, Spencer. You're welcome. Never call it a scimitar. So the scimitar was. <laughs> um, it, so the, the traditional European single-handed sword, like the Oaken Shot 12 we've been talking about today, had a lot to do with the type of armor it was used against and why. Um, and the fact that it was used from horseback and things like that. But, oh, look at that pretty. Yay! So now, speaking of, this is still a single sword. We were talking about single, we didn't say straight sword. -wise. This one's a Chotel. So this is something I've been really wanting from uh, Damon. And now this one's not sharp. I want to get a sharp one eventually. Now, granted, we can still probably cut water bones with this. Uh, I can't really good. Yeah, that's cool. So yeah, check out uh, Austin, Texas. It's uh, their Street Forge Armory. Street Forge, really good stuff. And I finally get to open that. So, what was it? Don't, too bad you don't have to be sharp to something to help with it. I did have a bunch of sharp things. I should have used like uh, you want to my around. Here. Yeah, I do. You're just a... Uh, oh, just, uh, thanks, buddy. Uh, uh, no. That would have been a cool game. It would have been actually pretty good. We have to plan on the future. All right. Thank you all for tuning in today. We really appreciate it. Uh, we we're going to get better as we go along, but it's just having fun <laughs> talking about projects. Uh, we really like interacting with the audience. We appreciate you as well. Heck yeah. Uh, Heck yeah. Adam, you got anything to say, bud? Um... Not really. I'm excited that we got this started. I'm really, really excited that it's going to hopefully take off and you guys are enjoying it. Um, and if you have any questions, comments, concerns, drop them in the chat. Yes, uh, please. And so we can make this better for everybody because the best thing we can do is make more sword dorks. More sword dorks mean more sword dorks to fight. Exactly. And honestly, too, once again, think about if there's anything else you want us to do for Chop Talk in the future. We're planning on doing this 5 p.m. CST. We're going to do it every other week, most likely, just because we're busy. And it gives us time to get more content. And we don't have a lot of swords yet, which we can change when we buy more swords. Uh, even like with Chotel. It's not sharp, but we'll still cut with it. Uh, please also check out our director's cut that we've been showing. Still give us some more views. Uh, we really appreciate that. It helps us get there. It's funny with the algorithm and YouTube as well. Uh, we're getting close to a thousand subscribers, uh, but once we get a thousand, we can then do live streams from cell phones. So as I start traveling more, I've got a steel fight coming up in Austin, Texas, June 18th. I'll be on the road, but I really want to still tune in and talk to you. So share, like, subscribe. Please let us know what you think. Thank you, Juniper. So nice to see you here with us as well. Yeah, Bill, it was an unboxing. Um, but other than that, Thank you so much, guys. We really appreciate it, guys and gals. And until next time, wander, wander on. on. Bye.